Hi, and welcome to my series of videos for Physical Chemistry 1. In the last video, we talked about the reaction orders of chemical reactions, and we saw that all chemical reactions with the same reaction order have some similar properties. For example, all first-order reactions have reactant concentrations that change according to this equation. Plus, the half-life of any first-order reaction can be determined using this equation. Today, I want to tell you about second-order reactions. As I mentioned in the last video, first and second order reactions are by far the most common, so once you know about those two, you'll have some powerful tools that you can use in your own research when you're making new discoveries. So let's talk about second order reactions. As I mentioned earlier, these are very common in nature. Suppose we have this simple second order reaction. Just as with our earlier example, we start with one reactant and we get one product as a result. What will be the rate law for this reaction? From our previous discussion, you know that the rate law will be rate equals k times the concentration of each reactant raised to an exponent. Since this reaction only has one reactant, that means a will be the only reactant in the rate law. Also, since we know this is a second order reaction, we know that the exponent is 2. Just as we did when we looked at first order reactions, we want to get an equation that connects the length of time the reaction's been going to the concentration of the reactant that still remains. To do that, we need to use a little calculus. We'll start with the rate law for a second order reaction like this one. Since there's only one reactant, the rate law must be rate equals k times the concentration of a to the second power. Let's put the definition for the rate that we learned in class into this equation. The rate is the change in concentration of A over the change in time. Also, remember that because A is a reactant, that means its concentration is decreasing, so delta A is a negative number. That means we need a negative sign in front of the rate. Now's where the calculus comes in. We can shrink the change in time and concentration down so that they're infinitely tiny. So we're taking a derivative, and that means we use dA and dt instead of delta A and delta T. Our next step is to perform the separation of variables technique, which you learned about in the last video. As we saw there, this means we want to get our two variables, concentration and time, on opposite sides of the equal sign. We'll do that by multiplying both sides by dt, so that time is now on the right side of the equation. Next, we'll divide both sides by the concentration of a squared. So now the concentration is only on the left side. So now all the concentrations are on the left, and all the times are on the right, and our separation of variables is done. Our next job is to get rid of the derivatives by integrating the equation. We integrate each side of the equation separately. I'll do the right side first because it's a little easier. On the right, we have k times dt, so we'll integrate that. The first thing we need to do is think about what the limits of the integral are. Since the variable we're integrating over is t, our limits are the beginning and ending times. The chemical reaction we're looking at starts at time 0 and it keeps going until some later time called t, so those will be the lower and upper limits. Now we can solve the integral. k is a constant, so we can pop it out of the integral, and that means our integral is just the integral of dt. From calculus, you should know that the solution of this integral is just t. We apply the upper and lower limits to this, which gives us t minus 0, or just t. That gives us a value of kt for the right side of our equation. Now let's solve the integral on the left side. The limits for this integral will be the concentration at the beginning of the reaction and at a later time called t. Let's call the initial concentration a0 since it's the concentration at time 0 and the ending concentration at. Now we solve the integral. To do that, I'm going to rewrite the fraction as the concentration of a raised to the power of minus 2. Writing it that way might make it a little easier for you to see how to solve this integral. From your memory of the calculus course you took, you might know that the solution to the integral is negative a to the minus 1, which we can rewrite as negative 1 over a. 
Don't forget, we also had a negative sign in front of the whole integral. So when we apply the limits, we have the negative of negative 1 over at minus 1 over a0. Let's simplify this by canceling some of the doubled negatives, which gives us a final equation of 1 over at minus 1 over a0 equals kt. And that's it. This equation ties together the beginning and ending concentrations and the amount of time that passed. This time, our equation doesn't have a logarithm in it, but all the other symbols still mean the same things. We've got the final and initial reactant concentrations, the rate constant, and the amount of time. Let's try using this to find the amount of time needed for a reaction. Suppose we have this second order reaction which has a rate constant of 0.543 molars to the minus 1 times seconds to the minus 1. If the initial concentration of nitrogen dioxide is 1.65 times 10 to the minus 2 molar, how long will it take for the concentration to drop to 1.00 times 10 to the minus 2 molar? We'll use this equation to find the amount of time. We know the two concentrations and the rate constant, so we'll plug those into the equation. When we subtract the two fractions on the left, we get 39.39. .39. Next, we solve for t, and we get 72.55 seconds, so that's how long our reaction takes. Notice that k has units of molars to the minus 1 times seconds to the minus 1. That's different than the units we had for k in a first-order reaction. As I mentioned before, the units of k are different for different reactions, so you want to be careful when you determine the units of k. Let's try another problem. Suppose we perform the same reaction, still starting with a concentration of 1.65 times 10 to the minus 2 molars. What will be the concentration after the reaction has been going for 1.5 minutes? We use the same equation as last time, but this time our unknown isn't t, it's the final concentration, at. So, first we'll plug in all the other data. Don't forget that the rate constant has seconds in its unit, so we need to convert the time into seconds. We solve the right side of the equation, which gives us 48.87 molars to the minus 1. Next, we add this fraction to both sides, which gives us 109.5 molars to the minus 1 on the right side. When we solve for at, we get 9.13 times 10 to the minus 3 molar, so that's our final concentration. Now, just as we did for first-order reactions, we can calculate the half-life of second-order reactions. We do that by remembering that at the half-life, half the reactants have been used up, so the concentration of reactants will be half the original concentration. We'll put that down here in the denominator of the first fraction. That gives us 2 over a0 for the first fraction, minus 1 over a0 for the second fraction. When we combine those, we get 1 over a0. So that's the equation for the half-life of a second-order reaction. Let's use it. What would be the half-life of the second-order reaction we had in the previous question? We know the rate constant and the initial concentration, so we'll plug those into our equation. When we do, we get 112 seconds. Now let's take a second and review what we know so far. We've looked at both first- and second-order reactions, and for each of them, we got an equation that ties the reactant concentrations to the time of the reaction. We also got equations for the half-life of each type of reaction, which are these. Let's look at those two half-life equations a little more deeply. As you can see, they're very different. The one for second-order reactions depends on the initial concentration. As you can see, the higher the concentration is, the shorter the half-life will be. That's very different from the half-life for a first-order reaction, which is always the same no matter how much material you start with. Clearly, the way the half-life behaves depends a lot on the reaction order. It would be nice if there were an expression for the half-life that we could use for any equation, no matter what the reaction order is. And there is an equation for that. 
Once again, calculus will help us figure it out. Here's how. Suppose we have this generic chemical reaction again, but this time we don't know what its reaction order is. Let's find a way to get its half-life. We'll start with the rate law, which is this. Since we don't know the reaction order, we'll just call it n. Once again, we'll start by popping in the definition of rate on the left side of the equal sign. Next, we perform a separation of variables. First, we move dt to the right side. Next, we divide both sides by a to the n. It'll be easier to solve the integral later if I write this using an exponent instead of a fraction, so I'll call this a to the minus n. On the right side, we have the same integral we solved a little earlier, so I'll just write down the solution of it, which is k times t. On the left side, you might remember from your calculus days that solving this integral gives us a to the minus n plus 1 divided by minus n plus 1. Don't forget, we also have a negative sign before the integral. I think the exponent looks a little strange with the negative sign coming first, so I'll rewrite the exponent slightly as 1 minus n. Now, when we apply the limits, we get this. Again, I think it's a little odd to have that negative sign at the start of the expression, so I'll switch the order of the two terms on the left side. So, this is our final result. It's a generic equation that ties together the beginning and ending concentrations of a reactant with the amount of time the reaction has been going on. And unlike the previous equations we've had, this one works for every reaction, no matter what its reaction order is. All we have to do is plug in the reaction order for n. Now, let's see what we'll get if we imagine what this equation looks like at the half-life. Remember, that means that the concentration is half what it was at time zero. So where it says at, we substitute one half of a zero. This actually makes it pretty easy to find out what the reaction order of a chemical reaction is. All we need to do is perform the reaction and measure its half-life, then perform it a second time with a different starting concentration and see how much the half-life changes, if it changes at all. If the half-life is always the same, the reaction must be first order, because as we saw earlier, the half-life of a first order reaction doesn't depend on the amount we start with. If it's not a first order reaction, we can find out the order by plugging in different integers for n until we find one that works with our data. As we saw earlier, most reactions are either first or second order, but this equation will allow us to find the reaction order even if it's something unusual. So this is a good, powerful mathematical technique we can use to find the reaction order of a chemical reaction. When we meet again, I'll show you another, even more common way to find the reaction order by plotting data from an experiment onto a graph. But for now, that's enough new material. I hope you'll join me again for another video soon. In the meantime, have a good week.